Welcome to this predicted paper from OnMaths that is based on the advanced information given to us by the exam boards. Please use this paper in addition to your other revision. You can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMaths site. OnMaths is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams such as topic based papers, demon questions and mini mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing. To answer this question, we need to cut this shape into two shapes. So we're going to draw a line across here, and we're going to cut it into a rectangle and a triangle. Now we need to first of all label the um, parts of the triangle. So the length or the width of the triangle, the base, will be the same as the base at the bottom, so that will be 20 centimeters. And we need to find the height, which is this length here, which is 90, degree, 90 degrees to the base. And to find that, what, what we can look at is the fact that the total height of the whole thing is 13. And the bit, uh, the height of the bit we don't want is 11. So what's left over? Well, 2 centimetres will be left over. So the height will be 2 centimetres of the triangle. So let's work out the area of the triangle first. Which is going to be half times base times height, half times the base which is 20, times the height which is 2, will just give us 20. Now let's work out the area of the rectangle, and that's just going to be the width times the length, width is 20, the length is 11, so that would be 220. Then to work out the total area of the whole thing, we're just going to do, add those together. So 220 plus 20, which is 240. The units are all in centimetres, and so the area units will be centimetres squared. So the pass mark for the test is here. And we can see that there are two students who passed the test. So it's two students out of two, three, four, five, six, seven in total. And we want this as a percentage, so we're going to times it by 100%. So we do 2 over 7 times 100, and that gives us 28.571, blah, blah, blah. And it says it wants it to the nearest percent, so that will be 29%. So firstly, we're going to work out what the um, percentage increases are as a multiplier. So we start off with 100%. Uh, Jane has a 1.2% interest, uh, pay rise, sorry. And so that would be 101.2%. And we divide that by 100 to make it a multiplier. The multiplier is 1.012. So we get the 20,000 times it by 1.012, and that gives us 240. Next, we do the same for Lenny. So that is Jane. And so let's do Lenny. And so that's 100% uh, plus the 1.5% will be 101.5%. Um, Make that a multiplier, 101.5%. We divide that by 100, which gives us 1.015. And then finally, what we do is we get the 17,000 times it by the multiplier. And when we do that, we get 255. So Lenny has 255. Jane has 240, so it says which of the employees has a larger pay increase and by how much. So the answer will be Lenny, and uh, it's by £15, because that's the difference between these. First thing we need to do is work out the area of the wall, and so to do that we're just going to multiply the 44 by the 40. So 44 times 40 is 1,600, sorry, 1,760. 
And the next thing we notice is that each tin covers 10 meters squared. So it actually means we can work out the fact that there are 1,760 meters squared in total for our wall. And if each tin covers 10 meters squared, then we will need 176 tins. That's the amount of tins we need. And each tin costs £5.70, so it'd be 176 times the 5.7, or yeah, £5.70, or you could do it as 570 pence and convert it at the end. And that gives us a price of 1,003.2. And so as money, that would be £1,003.20. A plan is a view that you would get if you were on top of the shape, so you were in an airplane or something looking down on the shape. So the sides of this that we'll see, well, we'd see this bit here, and we would see this bit here. So I'm going to start off with the first bit I shaded, and we've got to figure out what the different lengths will be. Well, this would be two centimeters across, and the whole thing is eight centimeters. The bit we don't want is three centimeters. So this part here will be five. It would look like it was five wide. So let's draw that on. And so we've got two centimeters down and we've got five across. One, two, three, four, five. And that's, this is what it would look like from above. Now the other part will be the same, same uh, two centimetres, but it will be three centimetres across. So we have three centimetres across. Now whenever you have a join or a change in elevation, you need to show that with a line across. And so this will be our completed answer. A side elevation is the view you'd get if you were standing at the side of a shape. So I'm standing here and it's the view I'll get. Well, it would be this trapezium here. And to know which side is the side and which one's the front, well, the front is always going to be labelled. They do normally label the size as well for you. So we're going to draw this trapezium. So the top bit is 3, then it's 6, then it's 8. So I'm just going to start off with the bottom, actually. That might be easier. And draw the 8 across. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Then I'm going to do the six up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like I left just enough room. Then I'm going to do the three across. One, two, three. And then all I need to do is just join up the start and the finish to complete the trapezium. So we're told that y is directly proportional to x. And so the first thing I'm going to do is replace that proportionality sign with an equals. And to do that, we need to introduce k. So y equals kx. So you just multiply the right-hand side by k. Then I'm going to substitute the values it's given us. So it says to us that when x is 5, y is 4.5. So when y is 4.5, and then we've got x is 5. Then I'm just going to quickly solve that my lines in and divide both sides by 5 and so uh, that's going to be 0 0.9 equals k so k is 0 0.9 so I go back to the equation and instead of y equals kx I know that y equals 0 0.9x now k is a constant which means it will never change so it's always going to be 0 0.9 so to find the value of x when y is 5.4, I'm just going to replace y with 5.4. And it's just a matter of solving again. So get my lines in. And what I'm going to do is just divide both sides by the 0 0.9 to find out what x is. And when I do that, I find that x is 6. So we know that uh, the equation of all linear graphs, which we have here, is going to follow the y equals mx plus c. And we need to find out what the m and the c are. So we're going to first of all work out what the gradient is. So that's going to be m. And the gradient is the change in y over change in x. And a different way we can write that is 
y2, so the y coordinate of the second coordinate, the y component in the second coordinate, take away y1 over x2, take away x1. And so y2 is going to be the y coordinate of the second component, which is there. It's going to be 40, take away y1, which is going to be 31. And then that's going to be over then the x component, so 24, take away 18, which is the x component for the first equation. So it's going to be 9 over 6, which is going to be 3 over 2, because just simple cancelling. So we know that m is 3 over 2, so we can actually just write out that that's going to be 3 over 2x, but we still don't know what the um, y-intercept is. So what we can do is have a look at the first coordinate, and for the first coordinate we've got an x and y co coordinate. So we know what x and y are. So what I'm going to do is just write out the equation I've just written out, but instead of writing y, I'm going to write in 31. Instead of writing x, I'm going to substitute in the 18. So it's going to be 31 equals 3 over 2 times, and the x component was 18 for our first coordinate. And then we've got the plus c. And so all we need to do now is solve it. So there's going to be quite a few components here. We're going to do um, 3 halves of 18, first of all. So 3 over 2 times 18, well that's going to be 27. And then we're going to subtract 27 both sides. And when we do that, we get the fact that c equals 4. Now if we know what c equals 4, we can then substitute that into what we know. So it's 3 over 2x, and we know that c is 4, so it's going to be plus 4. Let's write that in our answer. So 3 over 2, it could be 3x over 2. We could put the x into the fraction and then plus 4. If we try and visualise this question on a graph, then we've got c which is somewhere here. So we've got c which is somewhere here uh, at coordinates 2 minus 12. And we've got d which is somewhere here at coordinates 8, 4. And we're asked for the length of the line segment. So we're asked for this distance here. Now we can see that we can actually make a right angle triangle with this line segment. And we've got to find out what each of the sides is going to be. So the bottom one starts at x coordinate 2 and d it goes to x coordinate 8. So it's going to be 8 take away 2 which is going to be 6. So the distance there is 6. And how far does it go up? Well we've gone from minus 12 to 4 so that's gone up 16 and we know that when we've got a right angle triangle which this one is and we're asked for one of the lengths having given the other two we're going to be using Pythagoras so for Pythagoras label the sides A, B and C with C being the one opposite the right angle and we write down the Pythagoras' theorem which is A squared plus B squared equals C squared A squared we've said is 6 B is 16, and 6, plus six, uh, six, squ six squared plus 16 squared is going to be 292. And then we're just going to quickly solve this by square rooting both sides. And so we're left with 17.088, blah, 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 is equal to C. And because it asks it to two decimal places, we're going to write the answer of 17.09. So to make estimates from a scatter graph, we've got to first of all draw a line of best fit, okay, which would be something like this. And what we'll do is uh, to find an uh, estimate of test score B, given the fact they got 25 on test A, means that we would draw a line up from test A at 25, which would be here, and then across. And that's how we'd make the estimate. But Look at where that is hitting our line of best fit. It's hitting it here. What do you notice about this position here? Well, it, all of our data is down here. 
we don't know whether this trend continues up at this point here. We have no idea. For instance, um, if you were to plot a scatter graph of height against age, we would see it would increase like that. But that line doesn't continue on forever. Like you're not a 10 foot giant at the age of 30. You do s slowly stop growing. And so we don't know whether the trend continues. So we call this extrapolation. So we say that the data has been extrapolated. And what that means is it is probably not accurate. So when you have the data outside the range of the data, when you have a prediction, sorry, outside the range of the data, we say it's probably not accurate. If it was inside the data, we would say it's interpolated, and that's actually quite accurate. Whenever we do these kind of questions, it's always best to convert the pattern into numbers. So we're just going to count the dots. So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 9 in the first one. 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So our sequence is going 9, 13, 17. And we're going to see what it's going up in. So we're adding 4 each time. And that means our sequence will involve 4n. And then what we do is we go backwards 1 to find the zeroth term. So we're going to take away 1. So 9 take away 1 is 5. So the zeroth term is 5. And the zeroth term just tells us what to add on to the 4n. So 4n plus 5 will be our answer. So what's happened here is that the company's increased the amount of sweets by 15%. So we're just going to focus on that and work out what the multiplier would be first. So they started off with 100%. And they added 15%, and then they so therefore they ended up with 115%. And to find that as a multiplier, we get the 115 and divide it by 100, and that gives us 1.15. So that is the multiplier they used. Now they used that multiplier on the original amount, and they times it by 1.15, and they got the answer of 69. But if we're working the other way to find out what they times by 1.15, we get that 69 and we divide it by the multiplier. So if we want to work out what the original number was, we divide it by the multiplier and that gives us 60. So the answer will be 60. To work out the area of this sector, there is actually a nice little formula that we can use. And I'm just going to show you what the formula means. So the formula is going to be what fraction of the full circle do we have? Okay, so we're going to find out the fraction of the full circle we have. And then we're going to times that by the area of the, the circle. So to work out the fraction of the circle we have, we get the angle that we have in the uh, in the sector and we divide that by the total amount of angles in a circle which is 360 then we times that by the area of a circle so pi r squared let's use that for our question so the angle we have for this question is 57 times pi r now to work out what r is we just imagine the circle is whole. I'll do a badly drawn circle. And you can see here that this length here, this 5 centimeters, is the distance between the center of the circle and the circumference. So that is a radius. So it's going to be times 5 squared. Put that into your calculator and you'll get 12.435 blah blah blah. And it says it wants its two decimal places, so we ran that to 12.44 centimetres squared. The equation of any straight line can be written as y equals mx plus c. So we need to find the gradient, which is m, and the y-intercept, which is c, 
for this line. Now, we are given a clue. We're told that it's parallel to this equation here. But we're not really interested in the plus 5 at the end. What we're interested in is what the gradient of this line is, which is 11. Because all parallel um, lines have the same gradient. So we actually know what the gradient is for the line we're trying to work out. It's going to be the same because it's parallel, so it's going to be 11. So all we need to do now is find out what that plus C is. And what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in the values of X and Y for the coordinate we're given on the line. So it's going to be 46 equals 11 times 4 plus C. And we just need to solve this. So first thing I'm going to do is just times the 11 and the 4 together to make 44. And then I'm just going to take away the 44 from both sides. So we get 2 equals C or C equals 2. And we can put that into our equation. And that is our answer. So it's going to be 11x plus 2. So the way this formula works is we have M, which is the final amount. Uh, the 2000 here is our initial amount. The um, decimal in here is our multiplier. And the power here is the amount of years. So the way multipliers work is they are the percentage divided by 100. So if we go the other way and times it by 100 to make it back into a percentage, it will be 102.9%. Now it says what is the interest rate of the bank? Well the interest rate is always going to be 100% well this 102.9% is 100% plus the interest rate which will equal the 102.9%. So the interest rate is going to be the 2.9%. You always start off with 100%. So if I put uh, at five pounds into my bank, I've got a hundred percent of that five pounds. Then the interest rate is on top of that a hundred percent. So our answer here will be two point nine percent. This question relies on the fact that you know what the equation of a circle is. And the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Now r is the radius of the circle. So when I rewrite this, and I write it with our 16 there, we can actually rewrite 16 as 4 squared. Okay, Comparing this equation to this equation, we can see that r is 4. Now, this equation, the x squared plus y squared equals r squared, gives a circle with the center at 0, 0, at the origin. So... It means that the radius will be 4, so the circle will go all the way up here, all the way across here, all the way down here, and all the way across here. Now, I am really, really bad at drawing circles, and so what I would recommend you do is use a compass and measure out 4 and join these up. I'm going to try my best. I, I don't have a compass that works with this um, graphics tablet, but I'm going to try and draw somewhat of a circle. There we are. That's probably the best circle I'm going to draw. So what you do is you just get a compass and put the point at zero, and then you'd um, measure out four uh, units. So measure it between the zero and the four, and then just draw a perfect circle round. So to draw a box plot, we need five points. We need the lowest point, lower quartile, median, upper quartile, and highest point. Now we already have the um, lowest and highest points, so we can those onto our box plot now. So the lowest point is at 0 and the highest point is at 30 as we can see on the cumulative frequency graph. So we need to now find out where the median is. Now the graph goes up to 20, the actual line goes up to 20, so the median we're going to find at 10. We're just going to draw a line across and down and that looks like it is 17. So our median will be at 17. So we're just going to draw a line at 17. Get it just perfect. There we are. 
Okay, next thing, we're going to look for the lower quarter. So if the median, we drew a line across at 10, the lower quarter would do it at 5, which will be here. So that's at 12. So we're just going to draw a line up from 12. Fill in this box, and we can actually fill it in with the lowest point. And lastly, we need our upper quarter. And we do that by adding the 5 and the 10 together to make 15. So we're going to draw a line across from 15 and down. And that's 23. So a line up from 23. Try and get this as, as nicely as I can. I need to move that line a little bit. Oops. There we go. And let's fill in the last bit, join it up with the highest point. And there's our box plot. Since these rectangles are similar, it means that they have a scale factor. And we've got to first of all find out what the linear scale factor is. So what do we times 17 by to get to 144.5? So we do that by 144.5 divided by 17. And when we do that, we get the answer of 8.5. So our linear scale factor is 8.5, but our area scale factor will be the linear scale factor to the power of 2, because there's two dimensions with an area. So we're going to do 51 times 8.5 squared, which will be 3,684.75. So our answer is 3,684. 0.75. Now this question is on the calculator paper, so we know we're going to be using the quadratic formula because it asks us to leave our answers to two decimal places. So for the quadratic formula, we need to work out what a equals, what b equals, and what c equals. Now a is the number before the x squared, which would be minus 2, b is the number on, uh, before the x, which would be 13, and c is the number on its own, which would be minus 17. We're going to write out the quadratic formula, so it's uh, x equals minus b. Now I always put these into brackets, so I'm going to first of all just do the fraction first, just so we've got nice formatting on it. So we're going to have minus brackets b plus minus the square root of brackets b squared minus 4 times a in brackets times c in brackets okay and the reason we put the brackets is is that it's very very easy to make mistakes with the negatives and so if you put all the numbers in brackets you'll never make that mistake and it's going to be over 2a so that's 2 times minus 2 we're going to first of all put that into put into our uh, calculators with a plus there and when you do it with a plus there you get 1.813 blah 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 and then what you're going to do is use your calculator to go back to this and change it for a net minus and when we do that we get 4.686 blah 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 and so it's two decimal places we've got 1.81 and 4.69 um, capture recapture is a way of uh, estimating total population sizes and it uses a really nice formula which is n equals little n times little m over big m. Now um, n and m, the little ones, are population, uh, are sample sizes, okay? So they're the size of each sample and this big m here is the um, amount that were marked in the second sample okay so n is the first sample m is the second sample size and then m is marked so marked in the second sample because obviously you're going to mark all of them in the first sample so what you do is you catch an amount of a trout in this in this case mark them all with any kind of marking and then you capture again, and capital M is the amount that were marked from the first sample in, in your second sample. And then capital N 
is the um, estimated population size. So that's what you think um, the overall population size is going to be. So here we caught a sample of 84 and tagged them all and then we released them. Then we um, uh, caught a sample of 56 and we found that 15 were tagged. And so when you do the sums on that, it's going to be 313.6. And when you round it to the nearest integer, because obviously you can't get 0.6 of a trout, uh, we estimate it to be 314. So we're going to start by finding the multiplier. So we start off with 100%. It says it's decreasing at a rate of 8.1%. Uh, so we're going to take away the 8.1%. And then when we do that, we get 91%. 0.9%. Make that a multiplier by dividing it by 100, essentially making it a decimal. So whenever we get a number and we times it by 0.919, we're decreasing it by 8.1%. Now, there aren't any amounts given to us in this question, so we're just going to make one up. We're going to say that the population is 100, okay? And what we're going to do is type in 100 into our calculator. And then we're going to press the equals button. Now what that does is it stores the 100 in the calculator's memory. And it's basically, it's this next line that's the crucial bit. We're going to type in answer, which at the moment is that 100, times 0.919. And what that does is it says what the current answer is, we're going to decrease it by 8.1%. We're going to times it by that multiplier. And so every time we press the equals button, what it's going to do is it's just going to keep decreasing it by 8.1%. And we're going to count the amount of times we've got to press the equals button because every time we press the equals button, it counts as a year. So when we first press it, it's going to be 91.9%. Then press it again, it's going to be 84.4. So we're waiting for it to be beneath 43%. So if we started off with 100, we're looking for it to be below 43. So keep pressing it, keep pressing it. On the ninth year, uh, we get 46.7, so that's close to that 43. Press it again, and we get 42.9. So it's 10 years. It's 10 times you've got to press it to get it beneath the 43. I'm going to start by identifying the equations of each line. So here we've got y equals 2 because the y coordinate is always 2 on this line. This one here we've got x equals minus 3 because the x coordinate is always minus 3. And this next one is a bit more difficult but it's perfectly diagonal so it's going to be a y equals x line. But if you look, it crosses the um, y-axis at minus 1, so it's going to be y equals x minus 1. Okay, these are not inequalities, though, so we need to work out what the inequalities are. So we're looking at the region, which is here, and we can pick a point in the region. I normally try and pick a nice, easy one, so let's pick uh, 0, 4. So 0, 4 is in our region. So 0, 4, let's compare that to our y equals 2. Well, what is that compared to 2? Well, it's actually greater than 2. So it's y is greater than 2. We have a look at the fact that our line is dashed. It's not going to be equal to 2 because it's saying it's not on that line. Okay, this next one, let's have a look at this. Well, is it greater? Is that 0 greater than minus 3? Well, yes, it is. <clears throat> so it's going to be x is greater than minus 3. Again, the line is dashed, so it can't be on the line. Now, this last one's a bit more difficult because it's got x and y in it. So we feed in the values. So um, for our coordinate that we've picked, x is 0 and y is 4. So 4, and I'd, I'm just going to put, I don't know, not equal to, but um, or I'm just going to leave that blank, leave that as a box. And at 0, minus 1. So all I've done is fed in the coordinate values into this equation. And I've, I've got rid of the equals because what we need to do is work out what inequality it's going to be. 0 take away 1 is minus 0. So what is 4 compared to minus 1? Well, 4 is definitely greater than minus 1. So it's going to be y is greater than x minus 1. But 
if you look this line is solid it's a solid line it's not a dash line therefore we're going to put a little line underneath it because it can equal it as well to find the length of the rectangle what we're going to do is we're going to get the area and we're going to divide it by the width now the question says that it wants the minimum length so we want the length to be as small as possible obviously to do that we want the area to be as small as possible if the area is smaller the length will be smaller but let's have a look at a couple of fractions so let's have a look at a half and 1 over 100 which one of those fractions is the smallest well it's 1 over 100 but what do you notice about the denominator that as the denominator gets bigger the fraction gets smaller so to make something smaller we actually want the denominator to be as big as possible so we want the width to be as large as possible so we're going to find the lower bound of the area and the easy way to find a lower bound is find the accuracy where it says the accuracy is to the nearest 10 and what we're going to do is half that so half of 10 is 5 and then we're going to take it away from the area so it's uh, 98,540 take away 5 which will be 98,535 now for the width we're going to do the same thing, half the accuracy, half of 10 is 5, but we're looking for the upper bound, we're looking for the biggest it can be. So we're going to add that on, 1, 2, 3, 5. And when you do that calculation, you get the answer of 79.78542, blah, blah. And it says it wants it to four decimal places. So we're going to do 79 0.7854 so we're told that the two cuboids are similar which means we can have scale factor and we can work out the linear scale factor straight away to find out what we times the 14 by to get to the 49 we we'll do 49 divided by 14 big one divided by small one and that gives us 14 does it no 3.5 Okay, so we turn times it by 3.5. So 14 times 3.5 is 49. But that is the linear scale factor. And this question is all about volumes. So we're looking at going from here to the volume of the smaller one. Okay. So whenever we go from the bigger to the smaller, we're going to divide by the scale factor. So we know we've got to find the scale factor and divide by it. But the volume scale factor is going to equal the linear scale factor cubed because a uh, volume scale factor has three dimensions. Volume has three dimensions, therefore it's going to do the linear scale factor three times in a row, times 3.5, times 3.5, times 3.5, or 3.5 cubed. So the volume scale factor, we're just going to cube that 3.5 and we get 42.875. So it'd be 42.875. And so on our calculator, we're going to do uh, 4,201.75 divided by the 42.875, and we get the answer 98. If we know that the roots are minus 13 and 3, and we know that the quadratic can be written out like this, then that minus 13 shows us that the first part here, first bracket, is going to be the opposite sign to that. So if it's a minus 13, that's going to be a plus 13. And same with the second one. If that's a positive 3 as the root, then the bit inside the bracket will be a minus 3. So A is 13 and B is minus 3. I'm going to start by um, getting X equal to the 0.847 recurring. And I'm just going to show that with three dots. And we want to bring forward everything that's not part of the recurring pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out what 10x is. And that's going to be 8.4747. So what I've done is I've just got the recurring pattern after the decimal point. And what I want to do now is bring forward 
one of the occurrences of the recurring pattern, so the four and the seven, just one of them. So we're going to times it by a thousand, we'll find out a thousand x, and so it'd be eight four seven point four seven four seven, etc. etc. Next, I'm going to take away everything. So a thousand x take away ten x, and that's going to be uh, nine hundred ninety x, and then eight hundred forty-seven point four seven four seven etc. Take away eight point four seven four seven etc. It's just going to be the same as eight hundred forty-seven take away eight because the recurring stuff will just cancel each other out. So eight hundred forty-seven take away eight is eight hundred thirty-nine. And now I'm just going to put my lines in. And so what I'm going to do now is just divide both sides by 990. And so on the left hand side we've got x. And on the right hand side we have 839 divided by or over 990. So as a fraction it's going to be 839 over 990. So at the point on the graph where x is 12, um, this point here, and what you need is a ruler. And what you're going to do is rest it on so it becomes the tangent of that point. So I'm going to try my best to do it here. I'm just going to draw it out, and this is going to be my ruler. And I'm just going to move this into place. So we want that to be a tangent at x equals 12. It's about here. And then what you do is work out what the um, gradient of that line is. So I'm just going to draw a line across and up. And we know that gradient is the change in y over change in x. The change in y is 2. And the change in x is 1. 2 divided by 1 is just 2. So the gradient at x equals 12 is 2. Now notice it says x equals 12. It's a curve, so the gradient's constantly changing. But an estimate of the gradient at that point is roughly 2. And you, you just need to make sure you rest the ruler down, and then until you're happy with it, draw the line like I've done with the blue line, and then just work out the um, gradient of that. And if you just show all your working, show the examiner how you've come up with the value, even if your gradient is slightly off, you might still even be able to get full marks on some, some of the papers, if not one out of the two marks, maybe. A simple trick when you're finding the inverse uh, of a function is to uh, replace or to switch the y and the x. Now, we don't actually have a y in here, but we can just put one in. It's not a problem. So we can just rewrite this function as y equals x over 10 minus 11 and we're just going to switch around the y and the x so x equals y over 10 minus 11 now the objective now is to get the um, y on its own to make y the subject so we're going to first of all add the uh, 11 both sides and I've made an amateur move here I've not left myself enough room so let's just scoot that across Okay, so add the 11, so it would be x plus 11 equals y over 10. Next thing we're going to do is multiply by the 10 to get y on its own. So it would be 10 brackets x plus 11 equals y. Expand those would be 10x plus 110 equals y. Now this doesn't equal y. Um, we um, are looking for the inverse function with this notation here. So we just replace the y with this notation and we get 10x plus 110. I'm going to first of all work out what uh, the function f g of x is. And to do that what we're going to do is just feed in the um, value of gx, the function, the kx plus 2. We're going to feed that in as the value of x in the f of x function. So instead of 4x, it'll be 4 lots of kx 
plus 2, and then plus 3. Now this says that FG, uh, when 4 is put into it, it gets an answer of 187. So when 4 is put into it, well let's put that 4 into it. So 4 brackets, and it's K times 4, so that's 4K, plus 2, plus 3. And it says that that will equal 187. So we've actually got um, something we can solve here. Um, so I'm just going to rewrite that, but actually I might expand the brackets as well while I'm at it. So 4 times 4k is 16k, um, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 3 equals 187, and let's get our solving lines in. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is, well we can add the 8 and the 3 actually, while we're here. So 16k plus 11 equals 187. So we're going to take away that 11 from both sides. So we've got 16k equals um, 176. And then we can divide by 16 both sides. So we've got k equals 11. So answer is 11. To answer this question, we're going to do something a bit weird on the calculator. And this is a method you might not know, but it's the quickest method for answering this question. And what iteration basically is, is it's feeding the previous solution into the iterative formula to get the next solution. And you keep going and it, it will get closer and closer um, to an answer and then we write down that answer. But on our calculator, what we're gonna do is just press the, one, press the button one and then equals. Now what that will do is it will store the one that we have here in our calculator. Then we're going to type in the cube root button and the one will disappear that's not a problem because the next thing we're going to press is answer plus 10 so on your calculator it should look like this the cube root and then answer plus 10 when we press the equals button what will happen is it will work out what the next number is in our iteration so if we press equals, we get 2.22398, blah, blah, blah. Because we're looking for it for three decimal places, we're just going to work that out at three decimal places. So it would be 2.224. Then all we need to do now is press equals again, because instead of using the 1, it will use the 2.22398009091, etc. as the answer. So I'm going to press equals again and lo and behold I get 2.304. Press equals again 2.309 equals again 2.309. Now when you get the same answer twice you can stop. That is our answer. So our solution is 2.309 to three decimal places. So the first thing we need to realize is that we can create a right angle triangle from within this cone. So if I draw a line from the top going downwards, a line to the right and a line up, and we can label the sides. So we've got 30 here, and we've got 10 at the bottom here, and we're looking for this angle here, which we're gonna call Y. And if I just highlight all of this and move it across, then we're obviously going to be using trigonometry to find out what y is. So first step with trigonometry is, well, find out where the right angle is, which is there. And the one opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse. The one opposite the marked angle is the opposite. And the one between the right angle and the marked angle is the adjacent. In this question, we're not using the hypotenuse because there's no uh, letter or number next to it. Um, and so I'm going to do my Sokoto, S-O-H-C-A-H-T-O-A. -A. And we're not using the H, so we're going to cross out these two. We're using the TOA, and that stands for tan the angle, which in this case is Y, equals the opposite, which is 10, over the adjacent, which is 30. 
and so tan uh, so we're going to inverse tan both sides so we're going to have to solve this so let's get my lines in and we're going to inverse tan both sides so that will just leave y on the left hand side and then we need to find out what the inverse tan of a third is and the inverse tan of a third is 18 point four three four blah 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 now what I did at the start was I moved the diagram away from the cone let's just move it back and we'll see the fact that y is exactly half of x because we've done a line straight down the middle so to find out what x is all we need to do is double y so x is going to be two times y that's going to be 2 times the 18.434 blah 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 and so that is going to be 36.869 etc and it says it wants it to correct two decimal places so that's going to be 36.87 degrees you can complete a unique version of this paper by going to our OnMath site. OnMath is full of free content to help you prepare for your exams, such as topic-based papers, demon questions and mini-mocks. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing.